we're here. Got it. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, backyard fruit trees and whether or not you have um, are thinking about planting a fruit tree or you have just moved into a home or moved into a home several years ago that already had some fruit trees, um, trying to address the, the kinds of issues you're gonna be faced with and the kind of decisions you'll need to make. So the first question when somebody says they wanna plant a fruit tree is I always wanna ask them why? And I don't mean that in a, in a sarcastic way. Um, I really, you really do need to think about why is it you want a fruit tree? Because I think that's an important decision factor in when you make your final decision as to whether or not you're gonna put in fruit trees or keep the fruit trees you have. Um, and the, the answer could be, you just wanna know where your food comes from. You wanna know what's been applied to it. Uh, maybe it's food security. Um, it's the beauty of the blooms. Um, fruit trees can be quite beautiful. Um, or it could be like in the center there, you see a red fleshed apple. Uh, those are kind of hard to find. In fact, that particular apple, I can guarantee you, you will never find in any kind of roadside stand or um, you know, market. Uh, it, it could be to grow unusual varieties that you can't find elsewhere. And those are all perfectly legitimate reasons. Maybe you want to teach your kids about growing food. So I think it's important to think about why you want your own fruit tree. Um, I'm just going to touch briefly on kind of the horticultural nomenclature, because I think this is important to understand where our fruit trees fall into the horticultural family. Um, horticulture is grown, is divided up into families and genera and, you know, all, all the way down to specific varieties. So uh, the rosacea family is one of the oldest uh, families of plants. And it is so large, it's actually broken out into, well, the last time I checked, 17 subfamilies. It, there may be more or less by now. They, they keep changing all these things. But as you might imagine, it includes things like roses, but it includes also some of our small fruits like strawberries and our bramble berries, uh, our, all of our stone fruits, and our apples and pears. Um, and the reason this is important is if you've ever grown um, like a hybrid tea rose, what do you deal with? Black spot. Black spot is a fungal disease. F diseases tend to migrate around in the same family of plants. So if roses are susceptible to fungal diseases, it stands to reason that a lot of our fruits are also going to be susceptible to fungal diseases. So I, the only reason I bring this up is that just like your rose has issues, your, your apple or your, your peach tree are gonna have some of the same kinds of issues. And so it's just, uh, it just stands to reason. They're all kind of related. They're just like you might have your uncle's nose, um, you know, your, your apples may have your rose, rose's nose too. So I'm gonna cover not uh, everything, we only have a limited amount of time, but I'm gonna focus on cherries, plums, and peaches. And then I'm gonna go into the pome fruits of pears and apples. And then just a little bit of some other um, less common types of tree fruits you might wanna um, consider. Um, you might notice that I've purposely left out nectarines and apricots. Uh, they're kind of related to peaches, so kind of the same um, problems, the good, the bads, and the uglies <laughs> will apply to, uh, to apricots and uh, nectarines. And for each of these, I'm going to go over kind of what the good aspects of them, the bad aspects, and the really, really ugly aspects of them. So you'll kind of get a sense of, of where you might want to start out or not. <laughs> so what I hope that you can get out of this is the fundamental first question is, 
after you go through this and you look at the issues, what's going to be involved in keeping a healthy tree is which of these are worth my time and effort? How much time do I have? Um, how much energy do I have to put into this? And I always say it's quite okay to say none of the above. I'll just go to the market. I'll go to the roadside stands um, and, and buy my fruit. It's actually going to be easier for me. Um, we, I just had a neighbor move into my neighborhood and he's re-landscaping and he wanted to come over and learn about putting in fruit trees. So he came over and we toured him through our orchard and told him about everything that was necessary. And he, when he was leaving, he's like, you talked me out of this. <laughs> I am not going to put in fruit trees. So, and, and that's quite all right. Uh, he can come to my house and, and get apples. Um, but if you decide you're going to go ahead, you're going to go down this journey, then um, I want you to take away how to recognize and prevent diseases in your tree fruits, how to recognize and prevent insect damage. And then uh, last but not least, um, as you, you're not going to take away everything you need to know in order to keep a healthy tree, but I'm hoping you'll get enough to say, oh yeah, remember that was that was a fungal disease. And, and then you're gonna to need to learn more about it. So where you can get more information if you decide to go forward on this. So those are kind of the four takeaways. I think the first one is, is the most important. And it's, it's a good honesty check with yourself. All right, so we're gonna go into the stone fruits first because I think they are the hardest for us where we live. But we're, we'll go through them one by one. So cherries, what are the good aspects of cherries? Well, it's, it's a beautiful tree. The blooms are just gorgeous. When a cherry tree is in full bloom, it's, it's just lovely. Um, and who doesn't like to pluck a fresh cherry off the tree and, and munch on it? And, you know, kids love to eat cherries. So it's, it's a good accessible fruit for, for children. Um, and who doesn't love a good uh, cherry pie? You know, and it's kind of fun to go out and pick your own cherries off your own tree and, and bake a pie. So those are the good parts about having a cherry tree. The bad parts is it's actually very difficult to grow cherries west of the Cascades. There's a reason that most of the cherries in our, in our supermarkets, even um, you know, places that have local fruit, the cherries come from east of Hood River. Um, and that's because they're just kind of hard to grow on this side of the mountains. They are susceptible to many fungal diseases. And on this side of the mountains, we're much more wet. Um, we have all the, the climate, um, climate aspects that lend themselves to fungal diseases. And I've only listed a few here. If you um, have access to HortSense and you look in there, there's, there's a huge list of fungal diseases. I listed the ones that we often see um, come through the answer clinic. Um, bacterial canker, brown rot for sure, gummosis, shot hole. Those are the ones we kind of see most often. But there's a whole list of other fungal diseases that can attack cherries. Um, there's also a fair number of insects. Um, the cherry fruit fly I list first because that's what caused me to take down my cherry tree. I had a cherry tree I just loved and um, it was a pie cherry. So I actually was able to get some from the birds because they're kind of sour. They don't like, the birds don't like them as much as a sweet cherry. Um, but then the cherry fruit fly moved in and for years, I just had to throw away my whole cherry crop because every single cherry had a little fruit fly larvae in it, which was kind of disgusting. So um, we finally just took it down. But you can also have shot hole borer, uh, a cherry slug and the spotted wing drosophila. And um, henceforth, if you see SWD in my presentation, it's re referring to spotted wing drosophila because that gets tiresome to type that out all the time. So cherry trees require a lot of spraying to either avoid or solve these issues. 
and the ugly part of cherries. So I showed a picture here of the, the uh, spotted wing drosophila damage and um, what that little cherry fruit fly larvae looks like inside the cherry. And if you think about it, who eats, nobody bites into a cherry and eats part of it. It's like, you know, if you bite into an apple and you see an insect in there, you can just throw away the rest of the apple, but you just pop the whole cherry in your mouth. And, you know, so this guy's already in there. Um, uh, so it's, unless you like a little protein in your pie, it's kind of disgusting. Um, and the other, the bottom picture there just kind of makes me think of Alfred Hitchcock, um, but, but birds love cherries. They will just pile into a cherry tree and just strip it, strip it all before you have a chance. So netting a cherry tree is um, kind of a must if you have a sweet cherry and um, that can be a fair amount of work if it's a big tree. Whoops, too many clicks. So if you just insist that you must have a cherry tree or you already have one, um, but, but try to get one on dwarf rootstock. There is a dwarf rootstock out. Uh, so you can sometimes find a cherry tree on that rootstock. So those are gonna be easier to net. That's the most important because it, it's, it's a smaller tree. So you'll be able to get a net over it and they're gonna be easier to spray. Uh, the netting isn't going to deal with the insects. It's only going to deal with the birds. So you still have that issue. Uh, definitely do not ever overhead water. Um, keep it pruned out for good air circulation. Um, you want to just practice very good sanitation, just uh, cleaning up under the tree at the end of the season, all the leaves, uh, any fruit that's dropped to the ground. Um, if you see an infected branch, like you see some brown rot or anything of that nature, you want to get it out of there, get it off the tree and, and away from it very quickly um, before that infection moves down further into the tree and disinfect your tools. And a lot of this applies to all of our fruit trees, but it's particularly uh, important for things like cherries. And then I just say, you know, just hope for the best. And, um, and then I always ask if you have a chainsaw. So if you're gonna plant a cherry tree, uh, plan ahead and put a chainsaw on your Christmas list if you don't already have one, because I'm thinking in about five years, you're gonna wanna use it on the cherry tree. I'm, I'm being brutally blunt. <laughs> All right, peaches, another stone fruit. Um, there is nothing better than standing under a peach tree with a, pe a peach that you just picked and you know letting the juice run down your elbow while you eat it. It's just, you know, it just reminds you of being a kid. Um, and there's nothing like your mom's peach cobbler recipe um, also. So peaches are, are it's one of the best things to eat as a tree ripened fruit. Rather than buying those hard green things at the grocery store and letting them sit on your counter for a week to ripen up and they just don't have the same flavor. So that's the good aspects of uh, growing your own um, peach tree. The bad is that they are susceptible also to a lot of fungal diseases. They're almost as bad as cherries, not quite, but almost. Um, they can get cankers, they can get brown rot, and then they have a new one called peach leaf pearl. I mean, not new, but it's different from cherries. Um, and so a lot of peaches will get this peach leaf curl um, that's, that's really kind of hard. You have to do a lot of spraying in the, in the winter time when it's just blooming out in order to avoid that or get a tree that's um, not susceptible to it. Um, there are also insects that affect uh, peaches. The uh, brown marmorated stink bug, which I think we all know about now, um, can go after peaches. Uh, the peach twig borer, uh, a peach tree borer, one borer is not enough, peaches have two. And of course the uh, spotted wing drosophila again will go after peaches. Um, and it's also hard to set fruit in some of our microclimates. So if you live at a higher elevation, you have to be very careful about the variety of peach that you invest in um, because they bloom early. 
Um, even where I live at 700 feet, um, some years I hardly get any peaches. I have two peach trees and um, I just love them so much. I endure <laughs> all the difficulties uh, just because some years I only get like, you know, a handful of peaches. Um, and then uh, some years I'll actually get enough to, to can a few jars, but um, it, it's important to know what your microclimate is and uh, get the appropriate peach tree to uh, deal with that. And the picture on the left there is what peach leaf curl looks like. It can be worse than that, but um, it's the, the leaves get these, these horrid things and then you got to fall off, they get yucky and fall off and then you got to pick them all up because it's a fungal problem so it doesn't spread around. Um, and so that can be um, quite time consuming to deal with peach leaf curl. Um, there are some varieties like frost that are resistant to peach leaf curl. Um, but if you like the flavor of some different peach, then you got to deal with it. And uh, the picture on the right is a brown rot in peaches. Um, it affects the branches and the fruit. So, um, but if you are like me and you just are a diehard of having your own peach tree, then you need to, to kind of do some research and get varieties that are resistant to some of these uh, things like leaf curl. And there are some that are resistant to shot hole. Um, or if you're like me, I love the Red Haven. And so I just kind of deal with peach leaf curl every year um, just to get them. Um, practice good sanitation around the tree. And again, a very hard pruning every year. Um, and I mean, actually I prune my peach tree with, I attack it first with either a handsaw or my battery powered chainsaw. That's the size of the branches I'm taking out of the center of my peach tree every year. So it does need a hard pruning just to keep it down at a manageable size and keep it open for air circulation. And now we get to plums. Um, and I said with peaches, the nectarines and um, apricots are kind of similar. Um, apricots are even harder, I think, than peaches here because of our microclimates. We're a little too cold. Apricots bloom very early in general, and we can still have uh, a hail or a freezing rain or even snow while the apricot's blooming. And so it's sometimes very hard to get a good set of uh, apricots. But for plums, uh, for stone fruits, as far as stone fruits are concerned, plums in general are the easiest to grow west of the Cascades. Um, so that's one of the very good aspects of them. And the other good aspect is that some of the European plums are self-fertile. So you can only have one plum tree. Um, they do produce better with a pollinator, but that you will get some plums. And um, then Asian pears, they actually do better with a pollinator, but some are partially self-fertile. And uh, the Asian plums are very quick to bear fruit. And what I mean by quick is in the life cycle of the tree. So you'll, in fewer years, you'll get a uh, production out of an Asian plum than a European plum. The bad, it's our favorite fungal diseases. You'll, you'll notice there's uh, some similarities here between all of our stone fruits. They uh, are all susceptible to brown rot, bacterial canker, shot hole. Those are kind of the main ones for plum. Uh, there are fewer pests that attack plums. Um, we do have the brown marmorated stink bug and the uh, spotted wing drosophila, and there are some borer issues. But in general, there's much fewer pests that attack um, plums. Again, you have to be aware of your microclimate. Some plum trees bloom very early. And uh, so depending on uh, where you live, you may have problems some years getting a good um, production. Uh, I have a Satsuma plum tree, which I love the plums. They were actually loaded this year, but it does bloom early. And uh, so often I'll be looking out and I'll be having a snowstorm and the plum trees are blooming or they just about ready to set fruit. And so I don't 
you know, always get a lot of plums out of that tree. Um, this year I actually strung um, Christmas tree lights in it for the, uh, that I put on a dust to dawn uh, timer. And I don't know if that made a difference, but I had a tremendous crop of plums this year. I think that just kept a little bit of warmth in the tree um, over some of those cold nights. And it Karen, was, there, yes. oh, there is a question that has come in about um, attack by aphids, uh, asking if this is unusual or if this is a for, common for plums. For plums. Uh huh. Italian well, plums. Well, aphids will go out of aphids will go for anything really. Um, and so I would suggest if there's a big aphid problem uh, to really go for a uh, dormant spray. And I'm going to cover dormant spray a little bit later. So I'll, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on aphids there. But I've never, I've never had an aphid problem in my plum tree. But yeah, you know, aphids will go for anything. Um, practicing good sanitation in your plums and then pruning annually for air circulation and, and size control. Plum trees can get quite large. I'm not, I think there, there are some dwarf plums now available. I just uh, got a dwarf uh, Italian plum and put it in. So I'm hoping it really will kind of stay smaller um, because it is a big job to prune your plum tree every year. They grow like bonkers. And, and so there's just a lot of pruning, uh, pruning it down to keep it to a reasonable size. Um, I didn't have a, couldn't find a lot of ugly pictures of plums, but there's a, a brown rot plum. Um, usually it attacks the ends of the branches, but if you let it go, then it will get into the fruit and uh, nobody wants to eat that plum. And I wonder if the aphid problem could be uh, if the plums, if there were plums on the tree and they were oozing um, juice out or something, you know, the aphids are often attracted to um, the sugary uh, fluids. All right, so um, are there any, I, I can stop here and, and so that's the stone, that's the stone fruits. So, um, other than the aphid question, I can answer any others that are specific to stone fruits. Well, there is a question that's asking, is there a good resource to identify which trees are best for different microclimates? Um, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, a specific resource. I, at the end, I do provide a reference to um, Rain Tree Nursery. Um, they are up in Morton, up by Mount St. Helens, and they grow a lot of what they sell. They actually have a demonstration orchard. I usually look at their, even if you're not going to buy from them, um, I look at their website because they give a lot of good information on all their fruit trees and they will address things like this grows in a really cooler climate or uh, things of that nature. Um, but they would also be a good resource to call. If they don't sell it, they may not know the answer to it, but out of, they, they do sell a lot of, a wide variety of all the fruits um, that they might have a lot of good information about what goes well, particularly if they grow it up there, because if they can grow it up there, probably anybody in Clark County can grow it. Um, okay, and I can answer any other questions later on too. <clears throat> okay, um, pears. I'm going to go um, into pears first um, for the poem fruits. Um, and pears are broken out into two kinds, the European and the Asian. So I, I'm going to cover them separately. So the European pears, um, there are, the good parts are, they are starting to be available on semi-dwarf rootstock. Pear trees still get kind of big. So even on semi-dwarf, they're gonna to get to like 15 feet and they do need a rigorous pruning every year, but you can kind of keep them to a reasonable size. Otherwise, a regular pear tree, they just get humongous. Um, another good aspect is the winter pears keep in uh, cold storage for a long time. So you can keep them um, in your refrigerator and then, because winter pears, you pick them before they're ripe and then you put them in cold storage that actually 
um, makes them less mealy and accentuates their flavor. And then you can pull them out, um, you know, a few at a time and ripe, ripen them up on your counter for a few days before you eat them. So it's something you can spread out over a longer period of time of enjoying them. And uh, pear trees are easier to grow than stone fruits just in general. Um, one of my favorite European pears is the seckle pears, often called the sugar pear. Um, we have one of these and um, they, we had a good production off of them this year. They're, they're just, they're one you eat right off the tree. So you let those ripen on the tree. So they don't store for a long time, but um, you just pluck them off and eat them right away. And they're really, really good. Uh, often called a dessert pear. Um, I dried some of these this year and, and it's just a great snack. Um, for the bad, there are a few diseases. Um, there's European canker. There are several rust diseases that will get pears. Uh, Pseudomonas, um, scab, like same thing, it will attack apple trees. Uh, pear trees will, are susceptible to scab. Insects are not a huge problem in general. Um, and I think that the insects just prefer other fruits. Um, in fact, sometimes it's hard to get a pear tree pollinated because if the bees have a choice between a nice little apple tree or a pear tree, they're gonna go to the apple tree. They seem to prefer um, uh, something like an apple more, um, but luckily the pears kind of bloom at a little bit of a different cycle. So I've never had a problem with pollination. Um, you can get coddling moth, same insect that goes after um, apples. Uh, the two that are more common in pears are the pear slug and the pear scylla. Um, good sanitation um, helps avoid at least the, um, the fungal diseases. And pruning annually, again, for air circulation, you wanna keep a nice open structure for air to get through, let the leaves dry out and also to maintain that reasonable size. Um, I'm gonna refer a lot to a dormant spray and I'll talk about that later when we get into the general section. And um, most varieties of pears do require a pollinizer. So you do need two pear trees or you need one in close proximity if a neighbor has one. And again, the rain tree um, um, website has a lot of good information about pollinizing what you need to pollinize um, various trees. So with Asian pears, um, these are actually easier to grow than European pears. So you see a lot of Asian pear trees in people's yards um, because they're just easy. You don't have to do much to them. Um, the fruit will keep for weeks in your refrigerator, um, but you can also eat them straight off the tree. Um, they're easier to maintain a smaller size tree and they produce a lot of fruit every year. So um, if, if you like Asian pears and you want a pear, um, I would say go for that over a European pear. The bad, um, they are susceptible to some of the same diseases and in insects as your European pears. Um, I, I think we see far fewer issues with them, um, but they can get them you do need an Asian pear pollinizer. So you can't have an Asian pear and a European pear. <laughs> Unfortunately, you'll need two of each. Um, and you will do, do need to prune it some. It doesn't grow as much as a European pear, but it does need some pruning. And of course you need to um, you know, maintain good sanitation around the tree. And pears in general, um, that uh, the left is uh, scab damage. So that's uh, the same scab that attacks apple trees. So it looks similar as to what you get on the apple tree. And um, on the right, the, that's the pear slug, what the pear slug does. And you can actually see the little black dudes on there. Those are actually the pear slugs themselves. But that, it, it really can decimate the leaves of a tree. All right. And now we're gonna move into apples. And this is 
kind of what I know the most about. Um, I have I have most of those other fruits, but I have a lot of apples. So, um, and there's a lot more involved with apples. I think apples are grown more widely. So um, there's just more. So for instance, I'm going to go into rootstocks for apples because there's just more flexibility, more availability of different rootstocks for apples than the other fruits. So those, those pictures are actually some of my um, apples um, that we grow. Um, that's not my pie, but my pie would be just as gorgeous looking as that one. Or Erica's pie, Erica made a pie. Um, okay, so the good. Um, you can get non-grocery, you can grow non-grocery store varieties. Um, easily. There's many, many varieties of apple trees that you can get from nurseries that are not your standard grocery store apples. Um, so that's one of the good aspects, one of the reasons to grow apples. It's easy to, fairly easy to get them on dwarfing rootstock rather than full size. And we're going to go into rootstock, you'll see the difference. There are good disease resistant varieties available. Um, and uh, they store a long time in the refrigerator. Uh, I should quantify that. Early apples that ripen early don't store very long, but apples that ripen very late in the season, like ones that we're picking right now, will store for months. Uh, we'll still be eating them in February. Um, so they will store for a long time, a lot longer. There are a number of diseases that attack apples um, that, you know, it, it's again, part of our climate. Um, anthracnose, uh, bitter pit, canker, scab, just to name a few. <laughs> um, again, the list in hort sense is quite uh, larger than that, but these are some of the more common ones. Insects, the two most common insect that go after apples are the apple maggot and the coddling moth. And uh, I'm gonna go into some of the mitigation um, techniques in a little bit. Um, you must prune your apple trees every year, again, just to maintain good air circulation and to um, keep it at good fruiting quality wood and maintain the size. Um, the other thing that a lot of people neglect to do is you must thin your apples. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, I have a slide on thinning. Um, but that's something you're doing when the fruit is very small. And uh, so you're generally doing that in June timeframe, um, kind of when they're the, you should do it when they're kind of the size of your thumb, you should thin out your apples, you'll get a, a better crop. And um, if you do, if you have trees that are not scab resistant, then you're going to need to be doing a lot of spraying of fungicides just to keep the apple scab at bay. Um, and you have to control insects. If you have an apple tree, I can guarantee, pretty much guarantee you sooner or later, the apple maggots and the coddling moths are gonna find it. And um, apples do need a pollinator, but the good aspect of that is you can have a crab apple tree. So you can have an ornamental crab apple and one apple tree and the pollination will work out just fine. So the ugly parts, okay, so there's a picture of a, uh, an apple with bitter pit, um, and this is a calcium deficiency. Certain kinds of apples seem to be more prone to it, um, and it's not that necessarily the, there's not enough calcium in the soil, it's that the pH of the soil, or for some reason the apple is not able to take that calcium up. Um, and get it into the fruit. So if you see these little sunken spots, often they're green. And the reason it's called bitter pit is that that flesh is kind of bitter. Um, so you can cut those little spots out. There's actually, actually nothing wrong with the apple, but if it has a lot of it, it becomes kind of tedious and they're, and they're kind of ugly. Um, and then down there is the apple maggot. That's the kind of damage an apple maggot will do. It kind of tunnels through the apple. Um, making it pretty unusable. I'm going to talk a little bit about rootstocks. 
um, because I think this is one of the most important things if you're looking to plant a new apple tree um, and you're just starting to think about it and plan it out. Um, I don't even know if you can buy a standard apple tree anymore, but if you somebody offers you a, a seedling tree, <laughs> uh, don't take it. That, this is a standard size apple tree. You can see they just get huge. There's no way you can prune it or pick it or spray it or anything. Um, so those are definitely off the table. Heck, this keeps jumping ahead too far. Uh, 111, M111 is um, often called semi-dwarf. And, um, but they can still be like 85% of a standard size tree. It's still way too big. Uh, when we started planting, uh, we knew nothing about this. I had not become a master gardener yet. And all I knew was it said semi-dwarf and that sounded great. Um, so we planted M111 trees and um, that's one of them right there. Um, and you can just see it grows a lot of wood and that, that tree was severely pruned every year. You can, you can kind of see where the previous year we had cut it back and it just sprouts a whole lot of wood. So pruning is a big, big job. And you got to be up on a ladder and, you know, you got to cut out these big branches and, you know, then you got to chip them all and, you know, you do one tree and you're worn out. So uh, we eventually um, grafted over all of our 111s and um, took out those trees. So the next choice is, and this is mostly what you're going to find these days for um, something called a dwarf tree. And it'll either be something like M26 or MLA26. Don't worry about the letters. Those are just different variations of it. You look at the number. So if it's 26, it's always gonna be about the same size tree. Um, so those are easier to maintain at about 12 feet. Still for some um, trees, the, the vigor of a tree, uh, the variety determines the vigor of the tree and kind of how big it's going to get. So there are some varieties that I would not even want to have on an M26 because even on an M9, they kind of tend to want to be big trees, but you know, you sort of can't avoid that. Um, but uh, nurseries like um, Green, One Green World and Rain Tree, they're mostly selling um, Imla 26 uh, because that's, I don't know why. <laughs> they just do. <laughs> um, uh, so this is the best thing you're going to find locally um, from a good nursery. Um, you, they, and I think the reason they sell them is because um, they say you may not have to stake it, but I still think this size tree should be staked permanently. And I'll have some pictures here what, what that's going to look like. Um, because it particularly, well, we just had a, you know, a high wind situation. If you had a tree on this rootstock that wasn't staked, um, and particularly if it still had apples on it, um, it, it would likely blow over. So I think the best choice is uh, M9 or B9. And again, don't worry about the letter, look at the number. These are very hard to find, um, but it is a much better choice. And this is mostly what we have. And this is one of our trees. It, it was still young, it's, it's a little bigger now, but you can see the pole we put in to stake them up. Um, and that's kind of a permanent pole. Um, and these do need a permanent support. It will, it will go over without a pole to tie it up, to tie it to. You can see this one, the tree itself is tied right there. This, don't worry about the angle. We were trying a new pruning technique where you bend it over and then, and then um, you know, this becomes the, the main leader. We had trouble keeping up with that. So we kind of abandoned that. Um, but in the background there, you can see a more regular uh, tied up uh, pruning method. Um, so what we do if we, uh, if there's a variety we really, really want and we can only find it on M26, Imla 26, is we buy that tree, 
we plant it somewhere, maybe temporarily. And then the following year we get uh, M9 or B9 rootstock and we take cuttings off our Embla 26 tree and graft it over to our M9 rootstock and start over. So, you know, it takes like two years for us to get a tree going um, in that case. But for us, it's important just to have the really the dwarf size. And uh, it's funny, uh, rain tree sells B9 rootstock every year, but they don't sell trees on B9. I don't know why. So I always say, if you go into a nursery or, oh, God forbid you go to Home Depot um, and they, it just says semi-dwarf um, and nobody can tell you and believe me, I've run into this. I'm saying, what well, can you tell me? Is that M111? Is it M26? And they're like looking at you like you're speaking Klingon to me. I have no idea what you're talking about. I always say, run to your car. <laughs> Do not buy that tree because you're probably going to get an M111 um, is my guess. So you don't want to buy it unless you really know what you're getting. Um, and so the extra time you spend um, is, is far ben more beneficial than all the time you're going to spend trying to maintain that tree at a reasonable size and then doing like we did, grafting it over, which takes years, and then cutting down the old tree and pulling out the stump. Uh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> so I always advise people starting out is don't even go down that road. Um, one of the other things that apples particularly need, um, the other fruits, not so much, but a lot of apples you want to maintain, or all apples, you want to maintain a 45 to 60 degree angle for good fruit production. And sometimes that means tying them up. If the branches want to be more horizontal, you can see there the um, tie is tying that branch up. It's that pole that we put in is a, a good resource to tie the, the tie to and then tie the branch up to it. This is uh, some trees down the road from me. Um, so I noticed one year that they obviously had not tied up their branches. They also had not thinned. And so their branches are laying on the ground. Uh, there's the apples still on the tree laying on the ground. Um, I'm sure the rabbits just had a feast. So that's, that's not a good thing. You may also break that branch. And then sometimes in order to get that 45 to 60 to degree angle, you have to actually spread the branch out. It wants to be uh, more of a tight angle. Um, and again, that's a good use for the pole. You, put, you can make these branch spreaders. You can also buy things that um, um, just have a little Y on them. Um, but you can put one on the one end on the on the pole and one end um, on the branch. These are just little things we made with finishing nails. And uh, believe me, a good wind will blow it out. So I'm sure we got those laying all over the orchard right now. Um, Another common question I get is why didn't my apple tree make apples this year? Uh, so there's always a set of questions to ask is, uh, one, do you have a pollinator? Um, many, and then also many apple trees are biennial that they will only produce every other year. Um, and some will produce nothing on their off year and some will just produce a very small crop. Um, so if it, if, it, if it had a heavy yield the previous year, then that's maybe the reason it didn't yield this year. Um, and then this is another good reason to thin your apples. If you don't thin your apples, um, it, it, there's a good chance that your tree won't make as many apples the next year because it's, it just has put all its energy into ripening all those apples. It didn't have any energy left to create fruit buds. Um, and also, did you prune? If you, don't, if you neglect pruning for a while, it's gonna stop producing. Um, and sometimes it's just weather, or sometimes you have a cat that knocks the blooms off the tree. Um, 
nah, he doesn't, he doesn't do that. But um, you can see the spreaders, the, the number of spreaders in this tree and um, actually the cat likes them because it helps him climb up in the tree. So another reason for spreaders. Okay, just some general uh, things that, that apply to all of your fruit trees. Um, they need about five gallons of water each week. Um, definitely no overhead watering. And you wanna keep the area under your trees uh, clear of grass and weeds. So uh, one of the easiest ways to do that is you know, cardboard and mulch um, to start. If you have a grassy area and you plant a tree, then you can just lay out some cardboard or something of that nature and put a lot of mulch on it to kill the grass. But you just wanna keep the area underneath free of anything else because it's not only stealing all the water and the nutrients, but uh, weeds can be a haven for insects. Karen, there is a question that relates to that. Can you describe okay. how, to how to remove grass and how much grass should be removed, uh, like what area? Under the tree. Um, yeah, it's it generally. I would say the the drip zone. So the whatever the canopy of the tree is, kind of out to the edge of that canopy. Um, and um, I think the easiest way to do it is to just well, the most ecologically sound way also is to just spread out some cardboard and put a lot of mulch on top of it, and it will kill the grass underneath. And actually, that's a good weed suppressant, at least for a few years, till that cardboard breaks down but the cardboard breaks down and becomes um, organic matter too. Um, that's the easiest way. Uh, you, you, obviously you could spray something like Roundup um, if you're into that, but um, uh, or you could hoe it out, I guess. You could hoe out the grass, but that's why I say the easiest way is to do something like cardboard and, and mulch. And then once you have that, that you know, in place and the, everything underneath dies, then it, it's easier to keep it weed free if you just keep up with it. Um, and the five gallons of water per week, uh, one um, simple method, and this is something um, I do uh, with particularly new trees that are planted because we're not irrigating our orchard every week, but new trees need uh, like a weekly supply of water um, is take a five gallon bucket and poke some holes in around the, the bottom and then just go fill it up once a week. Um, if you get really hot weather, you may do it you know, more often, but that's a really easy way to know that you're getting five gallons of water on your tree. And then it just slowly trickles out and um, it doesn't just, just run off everywhere else. It gets taken up by that tree. And that could be a way, I guess, that you you continue to do it if you only have a few trees that might be simple enough for you. A little bit about pruning. Um, there's different techniques of pruning and um, so you just kind of have to pick one and uh, kind of stick with it, I guess. <laughs> well, I guess you don't have to stick with it, but just, but just be you know, aware of what you're doing and make a, a conscious decision. A central leader is with uh, one main trunk so that's the main trunk, and then it has branches coming off of it. Um, so this is a young tree, obviously. Uh, there's a lot more branches than you would maintain as this tree grows. Generally, I suggest the main trunk and about um, four or five main scaffolding branches kind of equally dispersed around the tree uh, for a dwarf tree. Um, and so this method is commonly used for apples and pears. And you see that the pole there is used to tie the tree up. And, but then there's your open vase. Um, and this is actually best for your stone fruits because you get better air circulation. So you have no central leader. So when you're training your tree when it's young, you cut out that central leader and kind of get more of a vase shaped. And then you just keep cutting it, all those things back each year. You can also do apple trees this way. And sometimes an apple tree just wants to be an open vase. Um, we have one that just naturally doesn't wanna have a central leader. So he's an, he's an open vase tree. Um, 
And there's nothing wrong with that. And then there's this Fallier. Um, it's a very pretty method, uh, but it is a lot of work. You got to keep up with this. Um, you have to do it when the, the tree is young uh, because you got to be bending these branches, you know, when they're young and supple. Um, and then you got to keep at it. Uh, just, I would say every probably three to four weeks, you have to go out and, and snip and rebend, you know, keep it kind of on the wires. And uh, it's, I, I had this idea of doing it um, for one row in, in our orchard. And then I read what was involved and I said, no, thank you. But um, it is nice along a fence line, um, if, particularly if you have a small yard, it's a good way to you know, have a fruit tree and um, uh, make use of your limited space. This is probably, I know a lot of people have uh, multiple variety trees. Uh, this would be, a, I think, a good way to do those if you only have room for one tree. Um, and so if you get one of those trees, then you could espalier it. Uh, it might work a little better. And there's other pruning methods. Um, I've seen, I've seen uh, fruit trees prune to spell out something. You know, you can do them at an angle and, you know, different angles and spell out your name or whatever. Um, but those are also are a lot of work. You got to keep up with it. That's called the cordon method. Um, I'm just going to touch briefly on mason bees. I know we have uh, master gardeners have workshops on mason bees, so I'm not going to go into a lot of uh, detail, but these are very useful for fruit trees. They're a great pollinator. Um, you get these nest blocks and uh, little straws with the, the eggs in them, and um, they, they come out perfectly on time when the fruit trees are blooming and um, lay their eggs for next year. They're just cute little guys, and I just love watching them out in the fruit trees. Um, on a really cold day, um, I'll go out and look and they'll be sitting in their little nest boxes with their little heads sticking out, just waiting for the weather to warm up and then they, they come out and do their job. Okay, I said I was gonna talk about thinning. So here is actually a picture of um, one of my trees. And uh, these are, if you'll notice, it's, they're too big. They sh this should have been thin before this time, but anyhow, that's what I had to deal with. But if you think about it, an apple blossom has like five or six petals. And if every one of them gets pollinated, you're gonna get you know, up to five or six apples in one cluster. And that's way too much. If, if that's a full-size apple as it grows, um, it's, it, it, well, first of all, it's, they're not gonna be able to get to full size. Um, also that space in between is a great hiding space for insects. So you're likely to get insect damage in there. Um, you're gonna wear your tree out. You're not gonna get much fruit production the following year. And with some kinds of apples like Gravensteins, they will actually push each other off. So you might end up with no apples. <laughs> so what you really wanna do is take that whole batch and it's very hard to do when you're starting out, but you wanna remove all but one for each one of those clusters. But you will get actually a better crop if you do it. Um, and they always say you pick the biggest, best apple. So you look at the cluster and if one's obviously bigger and it's in good shape, you leave that one and remove the rest. If the biggest one actually has a little damage on it, like, you know, sometimes we can get a hail storm before we thin. And if it's, I can see hail damage, I might pick the next biggest one that doesn't have hail damage. So um, you just, you just kind of make a choice. And then actually, once you get in the swing of it, it goes pretty fast to, to thin. You really just, you don't sit there and measure them or anything. You just, you know, you just sort of do it eyeballing it. But I often go into people's yards and I see a tree and it's not thin. And sometimes I unconsciously just start thinning without thinking about what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, you got to thin. So one of the methods of dealing with insects, if you don't want to spray uh, an insecticide, 
is to put these little baggies on your, your uh, fruit. Again, you wanna do it uh, very early when the fruit's very young. Um, so kind of right after you thin, you would put these little baggies on and there's you know multiple kinds of baggies you can buy. They're readily available online. Um, it looks tedious and I, you know, if, but if you only have one or two trees, um, it's, it's probably not a lot of work. Uh, and you just think about all the work you save, um, you know, trying to spray the tree and, and deal with the insects. So um, it's a good way to um, deal with codling moss and apple maggots. And then you want to remove those a few weeks uh, before you harvest just to allow the, the fruit to get some sun and color up, particularly if it's going to be uh, supposed to be a red apple. Um, if you do want to uh, use some kind of um, pesticide, uh, there are two good organic choices available. Um, and some of these will work for both things like scab and insects. Um, one is spinosad. Um, that is made from a bacteria found naturally in soil. Um, and there's multiple brands of that available. Um, I'm showing one there, it's called Captain Jack's Dead Bug. Um, and then another option is kaolin clay. And below there you see a tree that's been sprayed with this clay. And again, this is a natural mineral. Um, and there's one of the brands surround. Um, it is a little bit more difficult because it's got to be um, constantly agitated. So you can't just do this with a, a hand sprayer or a backpack sprayer. You have to have a pretty serious spray rig that's constantly agitating, uh, which makes sense. You got to keep the clay immobilized in the, in the water. Um, but with any of these things, even if they're organic, you always, always, always need to read and follow the label directions. Um, so for instance, the Captain Jack's dead bug, um, within a few hours of spraying it can kill bees. So you would not wanna spray that when bees are about to be active. You won't wanna spray that late in the day um, after the bees have gone to sleep. So that three to four hour time period is passed before they are active again the next morning. So even though it's organic, it doesn't mean it's, it's um, harm, harmless to everything. So always read the, the label directions. And then uh, the one thing I always say to do, if nothing else, is do a dormant spray. Um, even if you have disease resistant trees, like if you have a Liberty, which is resistant to scab and you bag your fruit, so you don't have to worry about those nasty insects, I still think it's useful to do a dormant spray. And that's done, you know, obviously when the trees are dormant before they start to bud out in kind of March. Um, and they're generally, it's generally like horticultural oil that's mixed with water. Um, and you can just buy horticulture oil by itself and mix it with water. Um, or you can get pre-mixed uh, solutions if you just have, you know, a couple trees. Um, and they're readily available. You can, I'm sure you can find them even at the Fred Meyer nursery section. Um, but what this does is it smothers those overwintering insects and their eggs and larvae. So with, uh, you know, if you had an aphid problem, um, or leaf hopper problem or any of those other little pesky insects, then do a dormant spray uh, because I think that will greatly help for the following year um, because it's going to just kill off all those lingering little guys hanging out under your tree or in the crevices. And with a dormant spray, you really wanna get the structural aspect of the tree. If you think about it, when you're spraying this, there aren't any leaves on it. Um, but you really wanna get the scaffolding of the tree very thoroughly, the trunk all the way down to the ground because that's where the insects, the larvae uh, you know, or the eggs are kind of nested in the little crevices of the bark. Um, and also it's good to spray copper, usually around Thanksgiving, uh, somewhere in that time frame, and that helps control uh, fungal diseases. 
And, um, you know, if you feel up to it, you can do a, a second copper spray um, later in the, in the winter. Again, dormant before the trees start to bud out. But if nothing else, do a dormant spray. I think that helps with a lot of the other uh, types of problems we can have. So in general, good housekeeping. I've already covered a lot of this. Uh, just sanitation around your fruit trees. Um, raking and removing diseased leaves, or I just say any leaves. I mean, almost any leaf we have on a fruit tree around here is bound to be diseased with something. Uh, picking up your fallen fruit, getting it away from your... Um, from your fruit tree, sanitizing your tools between your trees, um, and particularly if you notice any disease issue. So if you're working on a, uh, if you're pruning a, a peach tree that you see had brown rot, definitely don't go to your next stone fruit tree with those same tools without sanitizing them in between because you could just move that brown rot to the next tree. And keeping your area free of weeds uh, to avoid that haven for insects. Um, so other insects, yeah, we talked about aphids, um, earwigs, um, they really do, they're freaky, but they do little damage to the trees or the fruit. So they're actually kind of a beneficial, um, but I can't tell you the number of times I've cut open a peach. They like to go down in the middle of a peach. They don't seem to do anything, but it's kind of freaky. You take your peach into the kitchen and you cut it open in this, this little, strange bug crawls out is it's um it's kind of weird but rest assured he's he's just in there hiding they like dark places to hide and then leaf rollers they can damage the foliage um, on your fruit trees and again i would just think about doing a dormant spray to get rid of the leaf rollers and the aphids uh, some bigger pests uh, rabbits and mice they will chew on the bark of a tree um, and if they girdle it, it can kill the tree. So if you live in an area where you have, uh, if you live out in the country, you have rabbits or mice or things of that nature, um, I always suggest putting like a chicken wire or hardware cloth, just make a little basket that you put around the trunk of the tree, about 12 to 18 inches tall. And it probably should be there for the life of the tree. So make it big enough so that as the tree grows, the, the trunk grows with it. So I just make these things and, and wrap them around the tree and then the rabbits and mice can't get to it to chew on them. Uh, birds, there's not much you can do about it. They'll kind of come help themselves and peck, peck into the fruit. And if you live where you have deer, um, this is one of my babies, actually she's a mama. Um, they will, <laughs> You, you just have to keep deer away from your fruit trees. So if you only have one or two trees, you have to put a big basket around it or something so that they can't get into it. Um, if you have several trees, you might want to fence the whole area because they will find their way in. Um, they, will, they will chew on the whole tree. They will, they will eat it down. I've had young trees where they've kind of eaten it down to a nubbin um, and definitely they will eat the fruit. So um, I'm just gonna end with some other things you might consider. So if you've gone through this and said, why golly, I don't wanna have a fruit tree, that's way too much work. I understand, um, but there's a couple options that I think are uh, beautiful trees, they're ornamental, um, and they do make a fruit, whether or not you know what to do with them. Um, but a quince tree, um, it's, it's a beautiful pink blooms, uh, spring green leaves in the, in the spring. It's just gorgeous. We planted some just for kind of ornamental quality. They are self-fertile, so you only need one, and they're kind of disease resistant. Um, but we do get a lot of quince, so we've learned what to do with some quince. It's not a fruit you can eat pretty much just by taking it off the tree and eating it directly. They're pretty astringent and pretty hard, but there are some fun things you can do with quince with a little work or just have it for its ornamental qualities. Whoops. And the other one is fig. Uh, figs, uh, they grow very well in our climate, most of them. They can be quite large, so leave space for it if you don't wanna be pruning it pretty severely. Um, absolutely no work other than pruning um, needs to be done to a fig. Um, they're self-fertile. 
um, once they're established, you don't even have to water them. They're, they're just a, a wonderful tree. They produce a, a, a large crops of figs um, that you'll be giving figs away to your neighborhood if you have a fig tree. Um, I just, I love to have a fig tree around. It's almost tropical looking. So that's an option if you really want uh, something that produces food, um, but you don't really have a lot of time to deal with it. Um, I would say try a fig tree. So your decision points to close up here um, is like, you have to ask yourself how much time, interest and energy do you have to maintain a fruit tree? or multiple fruit trees. Um, and in fairness to all the people who have them around you, you're in your neighborhood or even some of our uh, small farmers around here who have roadside stands, uh, are you committed to managing the diseases and the pests? It is a state law. It's mostly for Eastern Washington because that's one of their um, econ economies of the, of the Eastern part of the states, but you know, it is state law that if you have a fruit tree, you are required to manage the diseases and pests. Um, and I always say in some cases, it's just easier to, you know, buy your fruit or go to a you pick option. If you want to introduce your kids to the joy of picking fruit, take them to a local orchard where they have a you pick. Um, there's always, there's always a way around it. Uh, so if you must, uh, the easiest ones, uh, kind of in order are fig, quince, Asian pear, or pear. And then with a little bit of work, you could have a plum, an apple, or a peach. An apple has got an asterisk by it, um, it should, of, you know, variety dependent. And I always say, just forget about doing a cherry or an apricot. Uh, to me, it's just not worth the, the effort, the pain. <laughs> And uh, with that, I can take any remaining questions that might be out there. And I'll leave this up. So if you want to jot there's these a, down. There's a couple of questions. Um, okay. One is, can you talk about, about fertilizing? OK. Uh, fruit trees, generally, after they're established, do not need fertilizing. Uh, never fertilize. Um, with a new tree, yes, to get it going. Um, I, you know, we'll put a, we'll put out a little fertilizer, but what we do is we chip our prunings and then spread them out under the trees or, or just spray a spread compost. And that's all the fertilizing they get. Now I will say, um, that some tree, I mean, if you have, a, a low pH soil, then you're going to want to put some lime probably before you plant and, and maybe yearly or periodically, just like a vegetable garden. Fruit trees want a more neutral soil. It's not considered a fertilizer, but it is a, a soil amendment. So there is a question about um, acidic soil. Um, mm -hmm. do, you, do you recommend a soil test or how would folks know how uh, their soil is as far as pH? I actually would if you're starting out and you have an area where you're going to plant your fruit trees, uh, you know, you can get a soil test pretty inexpensively. And, you know, Master Gardeners on the MG Answer Clinic there can email a soil test uh, kit, kind of all the information you need, how to take it and where to send it. It's, what is it now? Uh, Sixteen dollars, eighteen dollars, something like that. Um, it's it's inexpensive and it's worth it. And they'll tell you um, what you need to put on the soil for the fruit trees. And yeah, because you may need to add a boron or you know something else like that too. So it, it'll answer all those questions. Okay. And um, do you have a couple of um, disease resistant varieties for apple that you are aware of that you can recommend? Yeah, um, I had a slide on that, but I took it out because everybody wants me to stop at that so they can write them down. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there are some, well, like I mentioned Liberty. Uh, that's a very common one that a lot of people have. Um, I would suggest that, well, like at Rain Tree, they list, um, uh, they have a whole section on disease resistant apples. But uh, ones that come to my head are like Jonathan uh, Akane 
is pretty um, disease resistant. That's a good apple, uh, very good producer. Um, uh, there are some that I, that I know are disease resistant, but you would have no way of getting it. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and, and there are some like Carmen de Sonneville is a disease resistant, but we have found it very hard to grow here. So it's not one I would actually suggest for somebody starting out. Um, generally russeted apples are more disease resistant. Um, so things like uh, golden russet, uh, there's a Roxbury russet, uh, a very uh, Ashmead's kernel. Uh, they are actually less susceptible, even insect damage are less susceptible to it. Um, we have some very strange varieties, like we have some from a wild apple tree in Kazakhstan, and we have found that nothing ever goes after it. Even the insects leave it alone. I have no idea why. It's a delicious apple but there's no way you can access that other than if you want to get cuttings from us. <laughs> but um, uh, our tree's only so big, there's only so many cuttings we can do, but um, it's, it's one where we got cuttings from the Cornell Extension Service um, just because we're kind of fruit nuts. But uh, yeah, so there are some out there, but they would be kind of hard to get. But um, if, if somebody wanted a good list, they could email the uh, answer clinic and uh, mention my name and they could let me answer it. How's that? <laughs> Does that work? <laughs> that, that works, Karen, thank you. Um, I'd like to go ahead and launch the poll. And if folks want to watch for the poll, um, it should just take you a minute or two to complete. Again, the questions are in pairs, asking you to rate your knowledge both before and then after. The presentation tonight. And once we get done with the poll, I will go back to a couple more of the questions in the chat box. So you should be seeing on your screen the questions in pairs. And if you go ahead and just complete that, I can tell when we're getting close to full completion. Okay, people are telling me that the poll is giving us trouble. Um, I'm going to try and see if I can launch it again. Okay, I've hit relaunch. I'm not sure what's going on there. Can somebody indicate if you're actually seeing the poll and it's working? Okay, great. Thank you so much for that feedback. We'll just take another minute. Okay, the answers are flying in now. Thank you. We'll just take another minute.
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pose another question while the last of you finish up. Um, Karen, you mentioned bagging the fruit to protect mm -hmm. from insects. Is it okay to use plastic bags? I know I wouldn't uh, because they're going to keep the moisture in. You want something to breathe. Great, thank you. Uh, there's also a request to clarify the size of the hole if you're going to use a hole in a bucket. Um, the question oh, is, I is just it... use I just use like a big nail and you just put a couple um, uh, you know, like I put like three, three to four or five maybe on, on the side that's going to face the tree and then, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe one on the back side to, you know, get the airflow, get the, the pressure through. They don't need to be big holes. You don't want a whole lot because you don't want a lot of water coming out all at once. You want it to just kind of trickle out uh, so it all gets absorbed by that tree. Okay. And I suggest putting them on low on the side, not on the bottom, because the bottom, they get plugged up with mud. <laughs> okay, we have two more questions that I want to go with, and then we'll close it out. One question is asking, we moved into a home, um, and we're not sure on the varieties of the fruits. Uh, is there any way to identify the varieties? It, that's very difficult. Um, <clears throat> I used to send people to the Home Orchard Society All About Fruit Show um, because there were some people, they had a desk there of identifying your fruit and they were pretty good at it. Um, but the Home Orchard Society is, um, that part of it doesn't exist anymore. They don't have that show anymore. So it's that's pretty difficult. Um, you can sometimes... <laughs> You know, I, I've had people working in the answer, you know, when I've been in the answer clinic walk in and sometimes I just know it because I have the same one, <laughs> but a lot of times it's sort of like, I have no idea. It's hard. <laughs> and that's because there are literally thousands of varieties. Exactly, Is that correct? yeah, yeah. If it's something kind of common and was commonly planted around here, then, you know, there, you know, you, sometimes we have a pretty good guess. Okay, and the last question I want to go with is, um, what product um, do you recommend for sterilizing garden shears? Um, well, you can just do like, particularly if you're out in, you know, out in your yard, um, uh, you can just use Lysol, uh, get a can of Lysol and spray it in between each tree. That's the easiest thing to do. Um, or you can use alcohol or a, a weak Clorox solution. Um, okay. you, have to, you have to worry about the Clorox. It, it can corrode the metal. So you kind of want to oil it after you do that. But Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending today. And I want to thank Karen for another excellent presentation. And again, if folks have questions uh, and we can help you in the answer clinic, send us an email to mganswerclinic at clark.wa.gov. Go ahead and check out Green Neighbors and see what they have going on as far as resources for you. You can sign up for their newsletter. And um, if you would like to watch a recording of tonight's presentation, it will be available on our website in the next day or two. Thank you and have a good evening. Thanks, bye-bye.